Okay, in this presentation, we are going to look at the Dixon Q test for outliers. Now, in this presentation, what we're doing is acquainting ourselves with a four-step approach for hypothesis, hypothesis testing when we are using critical values. Now, this will be a, a, an approach that many people will still be taking in exams where the critical value will be looked up in a tables. There's other approaches that might be using like using p-values or using statistical software and they're becoming more and more common but it's still quite common to see this approach and the Dixon Q test is a great way of getting the hang of this approach if you're seeing it for the first time so the four steps are as follows what we should do is formally state the null and alternative hypotheses so always include a short written description of both hypotheses a little sentence for the null and a little sentence for the alternative hypotheses even if you're repeating yourself a little bit, uh, just formally state it, put it out there very clearly. And where possible, and that's a sort of statement that is relevant for the Dixon Q test, uh, state the hypotheses in mathematical notation. Now, that would be quite common when we're dealing with means and proportions and so on, but in this case, it's probably not as relevant and it doesn't help. So, as in a, a, a brief written description is sufficient in the case of the Dixon Q test. So the second step is as follows. Calculate the test statistic using the critical value or using for relevant formulae and determine the critical value CV from tables. Now that's really the basis of the approach we're using here. Okay. And then by comparing the values of the test statistic and the critical value, decide whether to reject the null hypothesis. Okay. So a little bit of a few remarks about that. We, what we do is consider the test statistic as a measure of the strength of evidence and the critical value as a threshold that we should cross or must cross for our evidence to be considered sufficiently strong. And we usually use the absolute value of the test statistic. Well, I usually do. And the reason is it just makes this decision rule that I'm about to show you much easier to understand. So this is a very important decision rule and it can be implied applied in pretty much every hypothesis test that you would sort of see in an exam situation. So there's two types of conclusions we would get. So there's two, two possible answers to a question like that. One is yes and one is no. So if we say yes, we reject the null hypothesis, which is to say we have sufficient evidence against the null hypothesis, and no, we fail to reject the null hypothesis, we do not have sufficient evidence against the null hypothesis. Now note the terminology that we're using. Essentially what we're talking about is the strength of evidence, not whether something is true or false. That's a very important uh, uh, thing to consider about hypothesis testing. We're not proving anything, we're just saying is the evidence strong enough, okay? That's a bit of a sort of a, an interpretation that I provide myself, I favor myself, and it's a good way of looking at it. Okay, now I realize that it's might be over, it might be oversimplifying a couple of things, but I think if you're new to this, it's a great way to sort of get started. Now, the Dixon Q test is related to outliers. So in science, it's quite often the case that outlier measure, an outlier measurement or unusual value is the result of faulty or unclean equipment or a data entry error or something like that. But care must be taken to assess that the uh, measurement is an outlier rather than, new, than an unusual result that is in fact genuine. So it's good practice not to remove out, outliers from an overall analysis, not permanently anyway. Okay, so that's the important thing here. So it's not completely remove them. Okay, but what you might do is that you might rerun the analysis a second time and then present the uh, all the obtained results with or without the uh, outliers, okay? And there may be an outlier, uh, there may be multiple outliers presented in the data. So essentially, this is how you sort of might treat outliers. And the Dixon Q test, and I have to admit now, it's a very simplistic uh, uh, test for doing this. There's more elaborate ones. But again, this is a very good way of getting used to critical values. The uh, the one we, the one we're going to use here is the Dixon Q test, and it's used for the identification and rejection of outliers. Now, this is an important thing, and it might come up as a sort of question. It relies on the assumption of normality, okay? And also, the test should be used sparingly and never more than once in a data set. Okay, so this is the test statistic here, okay? 
So to apply a Q-test for suspicious data, arrange the data set in ascending order of increasing values and calculate the test statistic as follows. That's our test statistic. The gap here is the absolute difference between the outlier in question and the closest number to it. Okay. If the test statistic, this is the crit test statistic down here, and the critical value, if the test statistic is greater than the critical value, where the critical value QCV is the critical value corresponding to the sample size and competence level, then we reject the questionable data point. Okay. And again, note that only one point may be may be rejected from a data set using the Q-test. So essentially you can't use it sequentially. Okay. So if there's a, if what happens in the test is that another one looks awkward, this test is invalid. It, it does not have the required assumptions. Okay. Uh, for making the test for a second outlier once the first one has been omitted. Okay. So here's a little example here. So what we have here is we have 10 numbers and I'm just going to write that in over here, 10 numbers. Okay. 0 0.189, 0 0.167, 0 0.187, 0 0.183, 0 0.186, 0 0.182 and so on. So there's 10 numbers there. Okay. Now, step one, this is our first step. And in this case, again, a short description, this is probably a bit too short. Okay. Uh, but just something like this, no outlier present in the data, that's the null hypothesis, and the alternative hypothesis is that there's an outlier present in the data, you may, must identify it, you should identify it, okay? So the second step is as follows, so uh, we're, that's just a, uh, a quick statement there. Now the, the second, st uh, second step is the test statistic, and this is again what we've just looked at previously, the gap over the range. Now the range is the maximum minus the minimum. Okay. Now uh, the gap is the absolute difference between the outlier in question and the closest number to it. So essentially this is our data set here. Okay. But what we must do or for this approach to be sensible is that we should put it in ascending order. So we have the minimum then the next lowest value and so on all the way up to the maximum. Now we want to see if there is an outlier here. Now I should have really identified it previously in the null hypothesis or the alternative hypothesis, but is 0 0.167, is that an outlier? And again, I should really have stated that here, 0 0.167, the minimum. Okay, now how did I know it was the minimum? Okay, the reason is it has a difference here of 0 0.010 to the next value. That's that gap there, whereas this one here is, the gap there is 0 0.002, which is much less. So we hypothesize that 0 0.167 is the outlier because of the large gap to the next number, which is 0 0.010. That's how you know. Basically, you just sort of make that comparison between the two maximum and the two minimum values. Okay. So, the test statistic is as follows. Okay. Gap over range, 0 0.177 minus 0 0.167 divided by the range, 0 0.189 divided by minus, uh, sorry, minus 0 0.167. So, that is 0 0.455. Okay. And again, that is 0 0.0. 1, 0 divided by 0 0.022. Okay, the range is 0 0.22, max minus min. Okay, so our test statistic is 0 0.455. Now, the next part is the critical values. Now, the way this table usually works is the n is the sample size which is slightly confusing, but in this case, this is the sample size. Also, what we're going to do is pick a significance level. Okay. So if you're not familiar with that yet, let's not worry about that. But essentially what I'm going to do here is pick alpha equals 0 0.05. Okay. So this column here. Now I've, uh, the sample size is that we have 10 
So our test statistic is this number here, 0 0.1, 0 0.466. Okay, so that is our test statistic. Now here, n is the sample size, it's usually denoted as n. Choose the critical value based on the sample size and significance level alpha. Now, this is probably going outside what we're trying to do here, but the this is an important consideration in choosing critical values, but I won't really deal with it in this video. Just suffice to say that usually alpha is 0 0.05, okay? So, yeah. There we go. Sorry, actually, that's not relevant anymore. I just changed it back to confidence, uh, confidence uh, significance levels. Okay, so now is the this is the decision rule. Is the test statistic greater than the critical value where CV is 0 0.466? Uh, then we reject the null hypothesis. And if not, we fail to reject the null hypothesis, not enough evidence. So in this case, at 95% confidence, which is the complement essentially of 0 0.9. Uh, at 95% confidence, we fail to reject the null hypothesis. Okay, we don't have enough evidence to consider the lowest value 0 0.167 as an outlier. Now, what we could do here is that we could vary it a little bit. So if we had 90% confidence, the critical value there would be 0 0.412. And at 90% uh, confidence, which is an alpha level of 0 0.10, we would. Okay. Now, uh, but that's sort of getting into sort of uh, some details that we don't really need to get into. Okay. So just as a quick remark, uh, previously this was written in terms of confidence levels, which is 0 0.95 confidence. Okay. So that's it there. That's the sort of quick uh, way, uh, quick way of getting ourselves introducing introducing ourselves to hypothesis testing.